Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's conversation at the Easel with Cynthia Tom. To share more about today's speaker, Cynthia Tom is a San Francisco-based visual artist working in painting, found object sculpture, installation, and curation for over 30 years. She intuitively explores cultural heritage, empowerment, spirituality, family patterns of trauma, and feminism through the lens of social justice, community, and healing. Her work has been shown at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, Marin County Museum of Contemporary Arts, Soma Arts Cultural Center, Los Gatos Museum of Art, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and more. Internationally, her work has been curated by Santiago Ribeiro of Surrealism Now. Her archives are in the collections of the California Ethnic and Multicultural Archives and the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art Collection. She's also the founding director of A Place of Her Own, an art space healing program for women of color and communities of color. Participants learn to explore and challenge chronic heartache and limiting beliefs due to ancestral trauma and colonization, gaining tools to access intuition and nurture self-care. Alumni of the program are invited to participate as exhibition artists, workshop facilitators, speakers, and event coordinators. Join me in welcoming Cynthia Tom, and please be sure to watch the chat for a link to a follow-up discussion on Zoom with Cynthia and alumni of A Place of Her Own. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you, Devin. Welcome everybody that's coming today. Thank you so much for being here and showing up for me. Um, my name is Cynthia Tom and I've been a visual artist for 32 plus years and doing community arts, working in the community. And I wanted to start out by thanking the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco's public program department for creating uh, ways for us to interact with community because there's hundreds and thousands of, of us artists out there with a lot to share and hopefully help. And also thank you to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the convening grant, Chris Matos, J.W. Deal, Susan Almazal. And I also wanted to say that I live and work on coastal Miwok ground. So today I was asked to talk to you, um, share how I use cultural heritage, haute culture and ancestral healing as art mediums um, and inspiration. And I'm gonna show you in a little snippet in 30 minutes, how I went from working with just personal favorite aesthetics and images to building a life that's all around social justice and healing in the arts. <clears throat> I just, I'm gonna show you a snapshot of a painting that I created and how I got to this final painting, this woman crawling on rice. It started with, I have a ton of magazine images. This is before cell phones. I started tearing out magazines, um, images. And when I start, I just plunk the idea down on a canvas and I don't have the finished idea. And sometimes the paintings can sit for years. Um, I'm showing you here, the uglies. This is how I start my work. And I normally artists will not show you the ugly parts. And um, so this is her evolving. And interesting enough, this is was done at the De Young Artist in Residency space on Irving Street in San Francisco, while the De Young was being built. And like I said, I normally have about 10 to 20 paintings just going at the same time. So I don't get blocked. And I didn't know what to do with this painting. It just kind of sits but I just have confidence that the right idea is gonna show up at the right time. I'll usually sit with coffee in a rocking chair and just have different paintings all around. They're all different sizes. And I invite friends and family to come and sit and stare at the pieces with me. So this piece eventually, I don't know why the rice came up for me and painting rice is not fun. I mean, it is meditative, but. I had to paint each one of these one at a time, highlight, shadow. And I normally don't know what the pieces mean when I'm painting them. And the titles often are as informational as the painting itself. The title for this painting just bubbles up in my imagination. This is called Research Series 3, Anthropologic Dig. And I'll allude to it more later, but it meant that I needed to find out more about myself. 
I had to dig for my for my cultural heritage because I didn't know what it was. And actually, Joe Sam was a mentor in Hunters Point Shipyard. He told me that I had to look at my ethnicity and gender to f to fill my art with more meaning. So, what today? What I want to cover this evening is what inspires my art, cultural heritage, haute culture, and then how making my art brought me the purpose of my life through ancestral healing, healing myself. I found out my passion is helping women and community. And at the end, I invite you to put YouTube comments, questions. But if you want to talk to us in person, and I say us because session two, we're going to drop in a Zoom link to a place of our own Zoom. And besides myself, I'll continue my talk just a little bit more. And then I'm going to have three artists join me who are from a place of our own, who are going to talk deeply about how they use cultural heritage and ancestral healing in their work to give you lots of ideas of how you can think about your life. And we're going to open it up at the end so you can actually interact with all of us live. So that's at six o'clock. So it's Pasamora, Manon Wada, and Katie Kwan. Again, we'll drop the link in later. So starting with cultural heritage as an art medium, how do you do that? Well, you start by looking at your parents and your family. These are my, my brothers, older and younger. So I'm third generation Chinese American from San Francisco. I grew up in a very multicultural environment. I learned to speak Spanish, not Chinese, because my parents had so much discrimination when they were growing up in the San Francisco, Oakland area, that they didn't want us to have any kind of accent. So they decided not to teach us Chinese. And then um, I grew up listening to old school funk and I grew up with a lot of cultural silence. It was just traditional in my family and many Asian families that I know, just silence. So as a child, you grow up making up your own stories in your head. And my story that I carried until maybe even five, 10 years ago is that I wasn't worthy. I wasn't worth very much. And this is my family now. And speaking of Spanish, my these are my two brothers, my sister-in-law's from Guadalajara and my two nephews on the right actually are Spanish bilingual with English. And what I'm showing you here is on the left is an art piece by my mom. And on the right is an art piece by my father. He ended up doing sculpture later in life when he retired. And my, and, but he never, he felt too humble to ever say he was an artist. My mom finally admitted she was an artist in her nineties. But this is indicative of the rest of my art career is she was a found object artist. And it was because of poverty. But it ended up being our biggest joy right up till she passed away. This is her Cleopatra sculpture that she made out of McDonald's coffee stir sticks back when they used to have little plastic red ones. You could see the, the McDonald's icon here. So found objects, we grew up with our neighbors leaving broken glass, broken plates, broken jewelry. And for us, it was like Christmas every time they did that. And I've carried that into how I do my art and how I teach art-based healing workshops because anybody can make art out of found objects. Um, my favorite place is Scrap in San Francisco. It's, it's a huge warehouse filled with things that are discarded, but in an artist's eye, you can turn it into magic things that make money even. So this is Muni bus shelter glass back in the day. I used to live in Hunter's Point and people would break the glass every other week and I would be outside sweeping it up and I still use it for jewelry and any kind of art making. This is a large scale found object art piece. This is part of the San Francisco Arts Commission art and storefronts. Back when things weren't going so well in the city, this is the, the mid 2000s, um, they, the Arts Commission started helping artists get vacant storefronts to put art up in to prevent vandalism. And mine worked so well, the owner was retrofitting. He had me there for three, three years and people didn't put graffiti on his windows. So my found object here is my Chinese iconography because I don't feel a connection with China. Mine is uh, kind of hokey, but it's the Chinese takeout boxes. I feel like that's my cultural heritage. So what other things inspire me aesthetically? Um, I would encourage all of you to anywhere you look, you can find inspiration. So 
this is just an apartment I lived in and a photograph I found. And this is what my brain does with looking at objects just anywhere. These are curtains. And then Chris Mott will send me a photo from Puerto Rico. And he looks for things that look like dresses to inspire me. And this is where my brain goes with that. And I've done other dresses based on this photograph. So my favorite inspiration are trips to Paris, whether it's in my imagination on YouTube or live, which I miss. Um, just everything there just fills my heart with joy and inspiration. And also I've just put Vogue here. I wanted to put up um, runway photos of like Lacroix and uh, Galliano and those guys just inspired me with color and shape. But I didn't know if I could do that without getting permission of the photographer. So you just have to go with my photos. The other things I love are wedding dresses and not for the wedding, but for the dress, the skit shape and sculpture. And this is one of the first dresses I did early on. So I just love the shape of the dress. I don't even know why, but I don't question why. I just allow myself to trust my intuition. Um, and then this is a more stylized, uh, where I started going with it was putting in a psychological piece. So this particular piece is about being able to play. This is a trapeze, like a circus. And then the, the ladder is like easy to escape out of or to climb into as refuge. And then another place of inspiration for me is things like having a dot-com job, which I was able to keep for nine months because the money was good, but the commute was an hour and a half each way, nine to 12 hours a day. I think it's insane. So I started painting images that allowed my brain to feel like it could expand. So even though I couldn't see it in real life, this was my aspiration, my imagination. The one on the right is called Solitude, and the one on the left is called Gardening at Night. So always people, places, and things inspire me. I love going into fabric stores, and um, sometimes it upsets the clerks, but I group together fabrics and take pictures that way. I love movies and um, or dressing up and just taking pictures because then I could take that picture as an idea. And this is called Soul Collage. This is a way to, it's to find out your inner wisdom, soul collage, but it also, for me, this was about abundance because of the buffalo and just showing strength. And this has given me the idea of the painting I'm gonna do at some point. So what else inspires me beyond, beyond just the visuals? And it became the ancestral healing. It became about peeling away family patterns and it's about self archeology. span so again, if you remember this painting, it was about digging into my cultural heritage. That's what this told me to do. So one of the things I did in my 30s, because I hadn't, I grew up in a neighborhood that was so multicultural that everybody was always running around in everybody's house. We were all friends. We were all connected like a family. So I never felt like I had to identify or that someone was an other. It was all, we were all we all shared space with each other, like it was normal, you know, like, I don't know, I wish it would be like that now. But I joined Asian American Women Artists Association to find out what about myself was Asian, because the one, the multicultural neighborhood I lived in, but there were only, there's only two Chinese families out there, and it was me. Now that the whole place is Chinese, this is Visitation Valley and Portola. Um, but back then I didn't know. And when I joined this organization, eventually they became but they turned into a nonprofit and I became the board president and the director for many years pro bono. But it was really important to me because this is where I learned that women were still invisible and that Asian American women in particular were completely invisible in the art industry. And to a certain extent, that's still true, but there's more presence now. And with the internet, it's so much easier to find artists. And that was the point about AWA.net is a place to find Asian American women artists from all over the country. So as I was trying to find my identity, I also decided I wanted to find out why I kept being attracted and attracting dominant and abusive men. It was just a pattern over and over and I was getting tired of it and I didn't know how to stop it. So 
I ended up looking at to my grandmother, my mom's mom, because I never saw my parents fight or disagree or even have a cross word. So I didn't understand where I was getting this pattern from. And I know my mom's side of the family, I have relatives that also were with abusive partners repeatedly or dominant partners. So I decided maybe my grandmother might have been worth examining. Now, she died when I was a teenager. She didn't speak English. I didn't speak Chinese. And I swear she never saw me. I was in her house, but I always felt I felt like she didn't know who I was at all. And I didn't really know her. So I went to the National Archives, which is right by the San Francisco airport. And I was able to find her interrogation papers. So every Chinese person that passed through Angel Island was imprisoned and interrogated and either passed through to San Francisco or blocked. And it was just Chinese. I don't know why, but my grandmother, I found out her story was, and I found out from reading the interrogation papers because my mom didn't even know the story, but that my grandfather who was born on Leland Stanford's property because his father was the um, head supervisor, groundskeeper. So he was privileged, but he went to China to find a second wife. His first wife had died, but second wife meant servant. So he went there and in the interrogation papers, it says, my grandmother said that she met him two days before the village, her clan's uncle gave her to him. And then she, she landed here. She got pregnant seven times. And then my mom was the second oldest. And it, when she was 12, her father died and he left them penniless. So I, I felt a newfound compassion for this woman I never knew. And I felt this screaming feminism come out of me um, because of this. So this is one of the first portraits I ever painted. And that's not my forte, but I feel like when I was painting this, I was trying to capture her eyes and her sadness. And I cried the whole time I was painting this. And I feel like that allowed me to let go of some very deep stuff. And I can't even tell you today what that is, but I, that's why I feel the power of art to help pass through pain, past, present, and future, like time traveling. And I started doing installations with her because I wanted people to know that there's this other side to the model minority myth that Asians carry around. Like we're crowned as engineers, dentists, doctors, and having these great lives and going to college and my family's total opposite. So, and I wanted to, to publicly thank Somerset's Cultural Center for ha hosting a Dia de los Muertos that is multicultural. And that was the, the brainchild of Rene Yanez, being, now being taken over by Rio, his son, because Rene has passed. But this was the first time I did an installation and I was really honored to be, even though I was Chinese, that I was allowed to be part of this typically Chicano um, process of Dia de los Muertos. So I started doing other installations. This, These are my mother's brothers and sisters. This is my mother here in the center. And I started sharing the story more. And this is the San Francisco Arts Commission Chinatown Gallery, which is sadly not there anymore. Um, the curator Janice Hom. Um, but my mom started telling me her stories from her childhood because of this. And it's the first time, this is my mom. This was the youngest picture I could find of her. These are vintage photos that I put on fabric and I started sewing them into pillows, hand sewing them. And I, I can't tell you why, but it was very healing on, on a lot of layers. But this is a picture of my mom. And she shared that when she was, before she was 12, her father traded, she, he didn't have money. He gambled all his money away, but he was an opium addict. So he would send her to get his opium and she was the trade for the dealer. Her body was the trade with the dealer. And she was never angry after she told me this, I felt like she was, she like let her shoulders drop. She finally, someone's listening to her and she didn't try to tell anybody before. And she said, what could I do? My father needed it, he was sick. So it was a very sweet way for her to be in the world and forgive him immediately. And then um, my father, I found out that a Chinese couple from Oakland went to China and bought him at age one from probably a very poor couple, brought him back to the States and they were gonna sell him. And there's called a paper son. 
that's a whole nother story I, I don't have time to go into right now. But it was very common for Chinese boys to be bought and sold that way in the 20s and possibly part of the 30s. But again, hand sewing these pillows was my way of going back in time and nurturing and holding and comforting my dad and my mom. I'm going to cry. Um, because they they had such hard lives when they were little and they turned out to be such amazing people, very kind. Anyway, um, my father and mother pillows, I started making more and more of these pillows. I probably about, have about 60 of them or 70 of them now. And I started putting my grandmother on the pillows and then my father, these are my father's pictures. I also found out my this is an orphanage with my father's picture. I didn't know about till I started sewing the pillows. <clears throat> And then eventually I put them into art exhibits all over the Bay Area. And then I've been on the East Coast, the Midwest, and now the West Coast. And this was Gallery Route 1 in Point Reyes, California. And I have to really thank them because they just gave me the gallery and said, do everything you want to do in here. You don't have to hold anything back. Because it is a tender thing to talk about human trafficking, especially when people are going to go to an art gallery as tourists, but they said, no, we want you to just speak your story, tell the truth. And I have to thank them for that. And uh, it was called Discards and Variances, Human Trafficking from a Chinese Family Perspective. And the Discards and Variances is people are so easily discarded still today um, through trafficking, through being discarded by families, but it causes variances in your adult life. and the trauma and the family patterns get all twisted up. So in this installation, they allowed me to hang the pillows low enough so they will hit people in the head if they're not paying attention to, to what's in the show. And then I wrote short stories about my grandmother, my mother and, her, and my father, their little stories so people would understand um, what it was. And I also had um, the, the latest report from the Commission on the Status of Women. I had other things there that brought in the kind of the humanities um, viewpoint. So back to my paintings, conveying things, telling me things. Um, this painting was developed during that time. And this painting has been iconic that I've done five different versions of it so far. And I didn't know what it meant, but it was definitely painful to do because there's nothing to look at. Um, I did have pictures of me with fabric to just get an idea of how fabric drapes. But again, the meaning came to me when the title popped up in my head and it was pull. And this is about, it, I felt like it told me you can't, you got to get off the floor. You can't be a doormat anymore. I have been a people pleaser my whole life. And now I know why I was a people pleaser because I thought that's what my parents wanted because no one said good job or great or, um, they just, they they couldn't do it. And I, and I don't blame them at all, but I, I've healed from this now. And I want to help everyone understand that women, and, and it doesn't have to be women, but that's my, my experience, but it doesn't matter how many opportunities or the rights that are given to us. If we don't feel like we deserve it, we won't take advantage of those opportunities. So to really help women move forward, we have to make sure that they're getting healing, that there's a place for them to heal first. So that's where my purpose came out of. The feminism came out of what happened with my grandmother. And then my paintings just slowly reveal this to me and my work with Asian American Women Artists Association. So one thing I've had to do is really learn to build my confidence who I am. And everything I've learned and everything I do is what I bring into this A Place of Our Own project that I've been doing program. So this painting was called Freedom to Concentrate. And um, it's in the collection of Diana jo Diane Jones La Lowry. Thank you. Um, but this painting started as a white, simple painting, kind of demure. And if you look in her skirt, there's this little stage. And I painted this in early 2000. Um, this is kind of a close up. It's not as in focus as I like, but the idea is there's this little dress form on stage in the middle of her skirt. And this means that you have permission to play different roles in your life, depending on who you're around. It could be for work. It could be for your family. 
you have to be a certain way, but realize that that's not who you are. That's the role you have to play because you're a human and you have to be here. But that the bigger you, the authentic you, the one that you know, the feelings you have, the things you like, the things you're that are meaningful to you, all go towards being giving you the confidence to be your authentic self. And that's what the flourish is. That's who the power is. So along those lines, also speaking for women and feminine energies, I, I started this painting and it's based on the emperor's tomb in China. And ever since I was a little kid, I just, I needed to, I needed to say, where are the women in this? So in, I couldn't create a piece that big. So I started a sketch that just was like a meditation on bringing women together. So they stop fighting, they stop being competitive with each other and don't work from lack and scarcity because that's a learned concept from patriarchy. And the cool thing is when I was doing this, the Smithsonian decided to take their 1977 What is Feminist Art collection and bring in a new fresh wave of feminist artists. And I was invited and this is the piece and the intention that they put in the permanent collection. So I'm really proud of that. So this was the final painting of the first in the series of, I hope, five paintings. So this is the beginning of just quietly gathering, women gathering and learning to trust each other. And over time, I'm hoping that the paintings, the, the dresses rise, because to me, that's women finding their voices, and then they become more colorful, just like that painting where the big flourish. And then this painting is on my wall in my living room. I will never give it up because this was the painting that told me what my life was about. And I started it with a wedding dress from Vera Wang. And I just plunked it down anywhere on the canvas. That's what I do. And then the background starts to fill itself in over time. And for some reason, I had these dress forms. Um, coming out of the back of her. I didn't know what it meant until the title showed up, Launching the Gifts. So this painting told me that I had to form a really solid self and understanding of myself so I can leave little parts of myself behind with people or communities that need ideas from me. Um, and this is an art installation, again, the same wave of idea. If I do some kind of dark and kind of heavy show, then I also put a way for people to get involved. So with the human trafficking show, these little umbrellas all had little hang tags that said donate to Asian women's shelter because they don't discriminate. They don't care what ethnicity you are. They will go help you if you get put in jail because you've been trafficked and they will find you help. So that's the kind of things I like to do in any kind of show I do, whether it's my own show or a bigger show. So spirituality and healing. I had to keep healing myself because I felt like I wasn't worthy. And this painting says I'm loved and lovable. I'm valued and valuable, which could be hokey. But if you say it enough times, you will start understanding and believing it while you're doing some deep work. We mistakenly think what others think of us. That's who we think we are. That's incorrect. And that boundaries are derived from boundaries from our Genetics, cultural heritage, and life experiences are only learning tools. And you don't need approval from anybody else. You're invaluable. And then this piece goes on to say, you're never in a position. You're here on purpose. And this really helped me. This is um, inspired by the Louise Hay book that's been around since the 80s, and it's still a bestseller. I highly recommend it. That helped me to really work on claiming that I was important and what I had to say was valuable. So that led me to then share how I did all these healing pieces with other women and end up being called a place of her own. And it asks them, if you had a place of your own, what would it be? And I have to say in 2009, the artist in residency at the De Young, if you could see on the bottom right is a picture of my dear friend, Renee Baldaki. She's, she started a lot of the public programs that have been deleted, but I hope that the De Young and the Legion bring them back because the artists need to speak to the public. We need to help heal each other. And this was um, an artist in residency where I started a place around, but what I found out was for we had 30 days 
for 25 of the days, most of the women had to talk about their trauma to get it out of their body before they could figure out what they want in a place of their own. So that led me to do what I do now. And it's this, this is part of a six month program. This is my art studio. And it's a very small group every time. And healing is a lot of slow work, but it's, it, this, you've seen all the pictures that drive me, um, that inspire me, all my art. So we're trying now to create online pilots and breaking the workshops into small bite-sized pieces. But the biggest one is the hungry ghosts. And it's digging into your ancestral and your family patterns. Um, because of the work that I did um, with my grandmother and my mother, it has given me so much insight into what isn't mine. A lot of the things that trigger me don't trigger me anymore. And this is a, a simple matter of drawing a family tree and then putting in your maps your patterns of trauma, like addiction, violence, alcoholism. And this was partially inspired by the work I did and lucky enough to do with this woman, Sylvia LaFerre. And she wrote a book, Don't Bring It to Work. And what she says is what happens at the dining table happens at the conference table if you don't address it. So this is the basic foundation of a place of her own. So last, I just want to talk about physical healing, my own, because I actually am working through what I've called, what someone's told me is a concussed brain where I have issues with my vision. I get dizzy reading and writing, but what it's also led me to, I'm also looking for the miracles in it. Um, I didn't do abstract paintings before. I kind of played at them, but I didn't really do them. And I don't know if you see their picture on the bottom right, Jack and Christina West were my angels. They actually last year when I'm in the throes of this dizziness and nausea, they asked me to do an abstract painting. They got me the panel. It's four by almost six feet. And I love painting big. And I was able to paint this back and forth, not looking at the image very much. I just kind of felt my way around. And again, I'm showing you the uglies of a, a progression in painting. The first one here was just me guessing what to do. And then I just kept adding to the piece, hoping that I don't destroy what's underneath it. And it's just trust and intuition. And I love how it turned out. So in a way, my vision issues have been a blessing because it's forced me to look elsewhere and to try break habits, which is so hard for us to do. So what you're looking at is, is the paintings behind me right now. These are the ugly stages. And this is the finished one right now, Maps of Concentration. This is called Metatron, who's an archangel in spirituality. And this is the sacred geometry representing Metatron. Um, and I'm lucky enough that the website I'm on allows me to start making reproductions available, which was never affordable before. So I'm excited about all these paintings being available because most of them are sold. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. This is how to find me. And I just wondered if I wanted to open it up to questions and see where we are. I know I spoke really fast, but it's a lot to get in. <laughs> So Rich, I don't know if it's okay, I jumped off. Um, yes. So if you guys have any comments or questions, if you put them into YouTube, one of our artists that's gonna be in the next um, series at six o'clock is Katie Kwan, and she's gonna help me here with the questions. So um, feel free to put them in. And then the other thing is if you don't, um, if you don't want to write them and, and hope we answer, what you can do is come in for six o'clock at six to seven. We have four artists that are, it's myself, but I'm just going to do a little snapshot. And then Katie Kwan, Pasamora, and Manon, Bog Manon Wada. And they're going to share some, um, their art is all completely different. They're completely different generations. And um, at seven, we're just gonna open it wide up and you can turn your mics on and come in and talk with us. That's the way we normally do things in a place of our own. Hi, Katie. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> I'm like, is anybody out there? <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I the reason why I didn't um, pop in a little bit earlier is partly just because there aren't 
not any questions, at least on YouTube live. Okay. Um, there's, mu there's a lot, a lot of love for you though, um, from many different pockets of, of your, um, network and, you know, your friends and all the connections that you've built over the years. So, um, there's a lot of love there for you. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that someone ha did pose though, the, I think the single one that we have at the moment is what can people do or resources um, to look at? Um, what can people do to support Asian American artists today? And then maybe what resources do they have to look into? Well, I can selfishly say, please go to awa.net. So that's A-A-W-A-A.net and really hardworking organization, always, always, going after grant money, which is always really small. A um, lot of people working for free. And right now I think there's what, 50 artists up on there. Uh, and we're trying to get more, but if you, click, if you click on any of them, you can actually see their artwork, read their statement. And I will say that largely, if you do any artists of color, but I can speak for women and also for Asians, artists of color, um, they tend to work in these realms of deep thought and community engagement and social justice. There's a lot of social justice. And um, where I live up in Marin, I know there's some organizations that want help that are white led that want help understanding how to understand BIPOC communities. And one of the best things you could do is start looking up artists online, but go to the groups like I know for sure Asian American Women Artists Association. Um, you could find out what they're doing right now. Our more senior members have a show up in Tanferan at a place called AZ Gallery. And they're called the Five Sunsei Daughters. That's S-A-N-S-E-I. And they're all exploring the internment camps and the effects on the Japanese community, which is so recent and so crushing and all the trauma that comes out of that unspoken is so, so you can find the artists that way. Um, and on Facebook, they're on Facebook. I don't know. Do you have any other ideas, Katie? You can listen to our six o'clock talk because Katie and the other women are all women artists of color. Um, Paz is Latina. And then Katie is Chinese and Manon is Japanese and Czech, I think. Um, and, and their family stories though, will come through in that, but Katie, you must have some suggestions too. No, I think you named a good handful of them to get started. And, you know, hopefully that will really encourage people to, to carry on researching more and, and looking more into different artists, um, yeah. that speak to them. Um, we do have a few more questions. One of oh, them okay. from the one and only Chili. Um, she says, can you tell us a little bit about place? Right, so A Place of Her Own, again, started in 2009, just kind of birthed it with the, the artist in residency that Renee Baldocki just let us have free reign with our ideas. And I just realized that there was so much violence and trauma and abuse in our community of women that none of them had a way to process it. Because the other thing in the Asian community, and I suspect it's true for most communities, is that women aren't allowed to work on mental health issues, whether it's your parents don't want anybody to know the secrets, um, there's all the shaming and blaming, or um, I hate to say husbands, but I'd say the male energies in the family don't want anybody to know what they're doing. So the women become very traumatized and silenced and crushed. So they don't use, actually there's a statistic that says that Asian and African American women uh, are the highest, are the lowest users of mental health services, but the highest uh, level of depression and dysfunction in the state. So with a place of her own, it just evolved slowly. First, it was exhibitions where I said, answer the question, if you had a place of your own, what would it be? But over time, I started doing workshops to help the artists get to their art piece. It would take six months or nine months to do. Um, but it, I started to realize it gave them community. It gave them a place to talk 
And because we're saying it's art, their families are, have been okay with them coming. So as long as they're making art and that's what we do, but the art isn't just like drawing or finger painting or whatever. It's very intentional, specific art. Like I have them make a love letter to themselves with a collage. And that sounds cute, but it's really hard to say nice things to yourself. And I'd say everybody that does that project, it takes them a year to finally finish it and bring it and talk. And then they want to talk about it all the time. Um, so place takes you down exploring your hungry ghosts, which is your family patterns and beliefs that hold you back. And then you start doing things to release those patterns and like the love letters or learning about the chakras and how it affects your body. Um, the other thing is then we start working on a piece for the a place of our own exhibition. So you have to figure out what what your aspirations are and you make them out of found objects. And largely I don't work with artists. A lot of people aren't artists, but they become artists or they claim their art after and they make art from the found objects, which means you have to trust your intuition that these found objects are gonna come to you um, to make the piece. And it happens over and over again. So I always say it with confidence now. And then they create the piece and then they have to talk about it. So you have to learn how to put your stake in the ground. And that's what all those paintings I showed you, that's kind of was my progression, was discovering who I was and then stating it, making it a known thing and owning it. And that's where your confidence and your self agency starts to build. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, but we have, we have videos on a place of our own YouTube where you can hear the artists give their talks about how, what they discovered about their art pieces. Is there anything else, Katie? And I don't know how much time we have left. Oh, we're still good. Yeah, I, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came up is how, how or has your personal vision of your place of your own changed over time? And as you've been facilitating place for others? <laughs> I'd say for the, so we've been around since 2009. I would say I didn't know what a place of my own was until now because I had to keep healing myself while I've been doing this project. And even the love letter, I couldn't write a love letter to myself. I used a quote from the Jane the Virgin christening, which is astounding. And it's a mother to a child. And I had to use that because I couldn't come up with it myself. So a place of my own now is a place inside me that's just solitude that because of the vision issues I've had, I've been offline for almost two years or a year and a half, good year and a half. And I've barely been on social media. And I was scared I was going to disappear off the face of the planet. And what's happened instead is I've been finding who are my true friends, which is represented in those paintings, those energies, I, those women I wanted to come and be part of is happening. And even this talk came up just fortuitously. Um, and there's even a winery called Cantadora, which means storyteller in Spanish. And this woman found me. So there's actually a wine, I actually have it here. I'm not drinking it, it's a bottle. But she's starting, this is a new winery she's starting and she's featuring women who work with the community on her wine to tell their stories. And then she gives part of the percentage of the money back to the organizations we work with. And that came out of nowhere. So I feel like once you can get comfortable in yourself, you will, things will come to you that you, and you can just sit back and relax a little. So that's a place of my own is a place where I can sit back and trust that I'm going to be taken care of. And I'm still working on that though. Um, I think we're, that's it. Yes, Rich. But thank you guys so much for being here. This is like a really big deal. And Devin, the director of public programs, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sheila's the head of the education department. Thank you for just letting me run my mouth off and share whatever I wanted to. Maria Rosario, thank you so much. But Rich, are you there? Yes, we'll give information on the upcoming 6 p.m. talk. And uh, thank you. We'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Yes. So jump over to the Zoom, place Zoom, sign up, just sign in with the link and then get a get your coffee and come back.